All right, so here's a little video that you can watch about shingling roof valleys. And so, again, just keep in mind the three most common ways to do that. The cut valley, the woven valley, and using some sort of metal. Um, they're going to recommend doing the cut valley. And one trick that I would just kind of throw out to everybody is putting something underneath the shingles where you're cutting, whether it's a piece of plywood or a scrap piece of shingle or something like that, because you really don't want to cut all the way through the valley and then have a cut actually in the valley because you're going to be essentially guaranteed to have a leak there. So watch that video, see some kind of roofing in action right there. Step flashing is really important. It protects where the roofing abuts a wall, okay? And they're gonna be individual pieces of metal, either nine or 12 inches long, depending on kind of what you're using, or sometimes they're like 16 inches long, but most of the ones we use are gonna be about nine inches long. It's an L-shaped piece of metal, and so one side of the metal is gonna go over the shingle, and the other piece is gonna go against the wall. You, you don't really want to see the step flashing. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put a piece of step flashing down, cover it up with a shingle. What you would do is you'd go starter, then a piece of step flashing, then put a piece of uh, shingle over that. And then your, your next piece of step flashing is gonna go at the shadow line of that shingle you just put on so that when you put your next course of shingles on, it's gonna cover up that step flashing. I only put one nail in the step flashing and I, I use the same nail as I'm using to nail the shingle down. So I'll put the step flashing in place, put the shingle down, nail through the shingle, and that goes through the shingle and through the step flashing. You wanna avoid nailing into this wall. And the reason is it's kind of a courtesy to someone 30 years down the road tearing this roof off. If they want to try and reuse those, maybe not so much reuse the step flashings, but they want to be able to pull them out from behind the siding because this is all going to get covered up with siding here. And if these are all nailed on, it's going to be extremely difficult to get those step flashings out of there without damaging the siding. Okay, so if you don't nail into those, you're tearing the roof off, those step flashings will just come right out. And then what's gonna happen eventually here is, this is gonna get, let me just say this picture isn't the best because what should happen is this house wrap should overlap those step flashings. The way this is working right now is if any liquid water gets behind the siding, which it will, and it hits this house wrap, it's just going right behind the step flashings. So that's not really accomplishing anything. It's preventing water maybe from splashing up, but what would have been a better installation is if these step flashings went on first and then the house wrap went over that and it got cut up from the roof a couple inches and then taped onto those step flashings and that would have been a nice tight installation. I have on here step mastic. Mastic is a big bucket of tar that you can buy when you're doing roofing remodels. So let's say you're coming back and you know this was the original layer of shingles that somebody put on and 25, 30 years later you're coming back to put another layer of shingles on you wouldn't be adding more step flashings because these are all tucked behind the roof. So what you would do is you would layer consecutive layers of tar onto the roof. Just so that you'd be the same idea as the shingle, or you know, the step flashings, excuse me. You'd spread a layer of tar so that you're sealing up the shingle to the wall and then you'd embed a shingle in that and you'd kind of step it up the roof. You're supposed to use some fiberglass tape if you're using that method because otherwise that mastic, mastic is gonna have a tendency to wanna crack over time. And there could be a joint that opens up here that is just gonna leak. 
Step flashings are different than roof to wall flashings. With step flashings, we're gonna install those in a roof to rake wall application. Okay, so as we're moving up the rake of the roof, moving up at an angle where those shingles are terminating against the wall. When we get to the top and our shingles are terminating against a gable, we're gonna use a piece of roof to wall flashing. And that's a 10 foot long piece of metal that's bent like an L. And that's gonna go, it's gonna cap the top, like last course of shingles, and then go behind the siding, okay? And the difference with the step flashing, the reason you wouldn't wanna use one continuous piece of metal if you were doing like a roof to a rake wall is that since each piece of step flashing overlaps the other one, there's always something underneath it, okay? If water gets behind it, there's a piece of metal underneath it, okay? It's splitting it almost 50% each time. So it's got an added layer of protection. But if you just put this flat piece of metal on a rake run and water gets behind it, then you're just on top of the deck. Okay, and it's not gonna really work very well. We need to provide some sort of ventilation method for a roof. And the most common one and the most effective one is a ridge vent. What you do generally is you go ahead and just roof it as normal, okay? Do all your roofing, but before you put the ridge cap on, you're gonna come back and you're gonna cut plywood out of the way, okay? You're gonna cut an inch out of the sheathing on each side of this roof, all right? When you have this ridge vent, in conjunction with some soffit vent, eave vents, that is gonna draw, that attic is gonna draw in outside air, dry air usually, and push the hot, moist air that wants to accumulate inside of this attic, push it out this ridge vent, all right? So it's gonna remove that moist air. It's gonna do some other things like keep the roof deck cooler in the summer, and also in the winter, ideally, keep that roof deck cold as well, okay? The reason you want the roof deck cooler in the summer is because you don't want those shingles getting too hot. They can degrade the life of the shingles. Um, it can warp the roof sheathing. And then when you have a nice cold roof deck in the winter time, okay, you're introducing outside air and air is passing underneath that um, roof deck. You're getting rid of, you're keeping that deck nice and cold so that the snow and stuff on top of that roof doesn't melt, okay? So one thing that can happen sometimes is you can end up with this problem called roof, uh, or excuse me, ice dams. And if you have snow that's melting on top of the roof, it'll roll down the roof as liquid water and then refreeze at the eaves. And then when it turns into ice and expands, it can push up underneath the shingles and cause damage, okay? But so anyway, we like using this ridge vent. It's very effective. It's continuous along the entire ridge, okay? There's a separate piece of ridge vent, which is this, that nails into the roof deck, and then you come back with your ridge caps and cover up that roof uh, ridge vent. This is what our ridge caps look like. This is naughty right here. See that nail shining right there? You don't want to see that, right? So let's go back a little bit to when I was talking about chalking courses. And the only time you're really going to notice if your shingle courses aren't straight is this last row right here, okay, where you have this terminating course of shingles running parallel to these ridge caps. And so it's this last course that's really the only one that really matters. You want this to be nice and straight and then you can chalk a line on that, and then you can use that as a reference when you're installing these ridge caps, okay? Some people like to run the ridge caps from both directions, each side of the roof coming into the middle. I tend to want to run them with the direction of the prevailing wind, okay? So if I installed these, I would have 
you know, come to the decision that the wind is mostly going to blow this way on this house so that it blows over the lip of this ridge cap. Roofs can be steep. Generally in our area, new construction roofs are four, five, six, and 12 pitch, highly walkable. Okay, I wouldn't worry too much about walking on those. You can walk, it starts getting a little steep feeling around a seven or an eight. And then like on an eight and 12 pitch roof, if you slip, you tend to just keep going. If you slip on a four or five or six, you'll just kind of like fall on your bottom and you won't slide off the roof. But once it starts getting steeper than that, it's a slide and you can go flying off the roof. Um, one thing that hopefully you remember from roof framing is that the steeper the roof pitch gets, the more of a direct load, more of a compressive load is placed on that rafter, which is e it's, it's easier for a piece of wood to take this load than it is this load, okay? So one reason you see a lot of older homes built with really steep roofs is that they could get away with like two by fours for the rafters and there wasn't as much of a load on them and, and it was a lot easier to build a roof that way. Um, but generally nowadays we don't do roofs that steep, but regardless, if you're working on a steep roof, you're going to want to use some sort of fall arrest system. A full harness with a lanyard and um, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's secured up at the top at the ridge with a D-ring on it that you can attach to. That's generally the best if the roof's pretty steep. If it's not terribly steep, you can get away with these J-jacks, but oftentimes you're going to be using both. These are J-jacks. It's a piece of metal shaped like a J with little slots in it. And you nail through that slot into the roof deck. Most of the time you wanna be nailing into a rafter, okay? It's not gonna do a whole lot of good if you just nail into the plywood sheathing, okay? And then you can shingle over those J-jacks and you can slip a two by six or a two by eight in there and then you have a little platform to stand on. What you'll do usually is Start at the bottom, work your way up, installing J-Jacks. You can put yourself and bundles of shingles on the J-Jacks and kind of work above yourself. And then as you come down, you'll take these down with you, okay? Um, there's kind of a cool method. I've never done it before, but I've seen people do it where you actually um, start at the top and work your way down. And so the cool thing about that is you can set J-Jacks up, climb your way up and you would chalk courses so you have an idea of where to start, where to land a course up at the top and you would leave that, you would high nail that first course of shingles you put on so that you could come back and tuck shingles underneath it. But anyway, you'd start with a course, you'd high nail it all, then you'd work your way up to the ridge, put your ridge cap on and everything like that and then jump down a section and so as you're working down the roof you're just done. Okay, so then you'd set up a lower section of J-Jacks, same thing, you'd have some lines chalked on the roof, you'd start there, high nail that first course, shingle your way up until you connect up with that course you started with, pull it up, you can pull it up since it's high nailed, slip your shingle under there, nail that down, and then nail that other course as normal. Okay, and that's kind of a neat way to do it, but again, I've never done it, and at this point, I don't want to work on a roof that's steep enough that I have to do that. Roofs, depending on the side, the solar orientation, on the north side, they can grow a lot of moss. It's not that big of a deal, but it could kind of degrade the shingles. And then what can happen sometimes is the moss can kind of grow underneath the shingles and then water can find its way underneath there. On a new roof, you want to avoid tar and mastic generally. But if it's a recover or something happened and you ended up tarring the roof for whatever reason, that's only going to last about 10 years. Um, the sun's going to break that down and you're going to need to go up and maintain that tar. Keeping it painted can help, stuff like that. 
but all the little rocks and stuff in the shingles are going to wash off and blow off. Uh, if you have a bunch of trees around your roof, the gutters and stuff will fill up with those granules and needles and leaves and stuff like that. And you're going to want to get up there and clean out those gutters. What can happen if your gutters get too full, they can back up and water can push underneath the shingles and you could have a problem. Okay. So wrapping this all up, I think we discussed quite a few roofing options. I would say generally that wood isn't really a realistic option anymore. It's too expensive. It doesn't last long enough. I don't think it's a good use of the material. It's a good use of the resource. You probably want, if you can afford it, you want to buy a nice roof, especially if you're young and you buy a 50 year roof, then that's the only roof maybe that you're ever going to have to do. Okay. If you buy really cheap materials, you're going to be doing the roof a lot and it's expensive. Remember that the labor component is the most expensive thing. Getting somebody up there to tear roofing off, load shingles on the roof, apply the shingles. Okay. You buy some nice, a nice roofing material, it's going to cost more initially, but if you don't have to get up there and work on it all the time, then it's going to save you money in the long term. Okay? And you want to be able to maintain this, make sure that it's been installed properly initially because there can be a lot of damage incurred um, from a leaky roof. Okay. There's a lot of water that's like landing on that surface. And if it finds a way into the house, it could be leaking and causing problems for a long time before you really know what's happening. So hopefully this was helpful to everybody and please feel free to uh, reach out to me an email or something if you have any questions or things you need clarified. All right, thank you.